Uh, good morning. Welcome to the early, early session. Um, I'm CJ Shu, and I have been, or I should say, I have found myself in the slightly immodest position of moderating and introducing myself. So uh, I'm an assistant professor at Ming Chuan's Department of Applied English. My specialty is contemporary American fiction. Uh, my other two co-authors could not make it today, unfortunately. Ying Hanzhen is a graduate student in the same department. Her focus is on the learning motivation of primary school uh, EFL learners. And uh, Joe Lavalli is an uh, associate professor at the International Business and Trade Program of the International College, also at Ming Chuan. His specialty is the psychology of climate change. Um, so today I will be presenting some preliminary results from our investigation of um, whether it is possible to use a customized GPT-4 to rate undergraduate EFL compositions according to a rhetorical rubric that results in reliable and consistent ratings. Um, so first of all, ChatGPT. I'm sure I don't have to say too much about this. It's taken the world by storm these past two years. Even if you haven't used it before, I'm sure you uh, have been exposed to its effects. Um, but the two key ideas uh, related to our research is that it takes natural language inputs. So you don't need uh, fancy coding. You can talk to it um, just like, well, almost like, a person and it can do uh, hopefully what you want it to do. Um, and the other main point is that it is a large language model, which means that it was created using uh, machine learning and iterative, iterative training uh, based on large data sets. Um, now, currently, there are two interfaces available to the public. The first one is GPT 3.5, which is free, uh, which is, I think, it's only um, advantage. Um, but if you're willing to pay a bit of money each month, there's also the slightly better GPT-4. Um, and OpenAI, the company behind ChatGPT, says that GPT-4 uh, performs better, has real-time access to the internet, allegedly. Um, and every study I've seen has indeed shown that uh, GPT-4 outperforms GPT-3.5. Um, but more related to this um, report is that GPT-4 allows you to customize its knowledge base. Um, I talked to an expert in AI. Apparently, this is not its actual knowledge base. It's simply a more efficient and uh, persistent means of input. Um, but the idea is that you can create a customizable, uh, a customized version of GPT-4. Uh, OpenAI is calling these GPTs. Very confusing, I know. Um, and you can input information and it will retain that information for the duration of your use. Um, and it's also worth noting that the paid tier GPT-4 also sets a time limit per day um, because OpenAI does not have infinite resources yet. So let's say, uh, talk a bit more about how we decided to customize a GPT for this um, research. Um, hopefully, the idea is that by inputting, like when we rate um, compositions, there should be some kind of standard, uh, and that standard would apply to the entire batch of compositions that we're rating. Um, so by inputting those standards as the uh, knowledge base input, we can um, save time on redundancy, right? We don't have to input it anew each time. And so if we can design a customized GPT that is reliable and consistent in rating compositions. Uh, the immediate benefits would include increased instructor efficiency. Uh, we know that when teaching and rating and assessing uh, compositions, it takes a lot of time, right? You have to not only have to read each one, uh, students usually look for detailed feedback from their instructor, so you can't just say, oh, it's good, it's bad, or, you know, do this, do that. Uh, ideally, you would also be able to give detailed feedback on the language use, any mistakes, uh, and so it takes a lot of time uh, per assigned composition. And, of course, each 
um, writing course does not only assign one composition. So if we can um, outsource the part of the assessment process to GPT, it's automated, it's basically immediate. And so if it's reliable and consistent, that would save a lot of time for instructors. Um, and so if some writing instructors feel like students would benefit from more assignments or from uh, alternative viewpoints of feedback, um, such an ideal GPT would be able to help with that. Um, and the reason we chose this uh, automated system is because we hope that uh, if our hypothesis proves true, um, it would maintain ecological validity, meaning that it's widely accessible to any instructor who's willing to shill out the monthly fee. Um, and so uh, it, this would be different from uh, many prior so-called um, automated writing evaluation systems, uh, which would require you to, there, there would be a, a learning curve on how to use it. Some of them uh, for the more detailed functions also require coding, but GPT does not. It's entirely um, or almost entirely natural language input. Um, so if we can get the uh, knowledge base input right, then, uh, and if it is reliable and consistent, um, then writing instructors can simply take our customized GPT, um, input their own rubrics, perhaps modify the instructions a little bit, and hopefully they would be able to achieve the same uh, productivity um, improvements. Uh, and being widely accessible and um, preserving ecological, ecological validity also means that uh, the, the learning curve is much lower. So even instructors who are not familiar with uh, high-tech classroom pedagogical instruments can be able to use this. Um, and so if it works, it could also contribute to narrowing uh, learning gaps uh, between um, um, places with resources and places with fewer resources, between instructors who know how to use ed tech and instructors who uh, have a harder time doing this. So these are the benefits we're looking for. Um, so let's talk a bit about um, writing instruction and um, writing evaluation and rating. So throughout much of the second half of the 20th century, the, especially the latter decades, writing pedagogy was more focused on so-called process writing. Um, and um, from Zen 2005, we have a summary of what this usually means, quote, Process-oriented ESL teachers gave students ample time and freedom to write on topics of their own choice. ESL teachers were encouraged to use language to explore, to voice, to share their beliefs, values, and experiences. So you see here the emphasis on learner authenticity. Continuing the quote, fluency was emphasized over accuracy. Teacher conferencing and peer review were adopted to give ESL student writers feedback for revision. Teaching effective strategies at each stage of the writing process became an important component of a writing class, end quote. Uh, so you see that it's also skills based, right? It says fluency is more important, emphasizing different stages of writing. Uh, and according to CO 2002, these stages included, quote, planning, drafting or writing, revising or redrafting and editing as well as three other stages externally imposed on students by the teacher, namely responding or sharing, evaluating, and post writing, end quote. Uh, and that these stages were usually presented in a highly structured progression focused on orderly teaching of skills. Um, so these are the main strengths of uh, process writing, but there are also some uh, demerits. So as Zamel 1987 points out, um, even though the design of process writing is focused on, you know, the, the experience and the learner authenticity uh, and the resulting composition itself is still evaluated. But in practice, uh, some teachers, uh, some instructors may overemphasize process at the expense of the product. Uh, and another demerit is that some scholars believe uh, as Scala and et al. do, that uh, this might be a Western-centric approach to writing focused on individual uh, experience and authenticity. And so 
uh, from their teaching experience, they have found that uh, some students uh, in the Sinosphere, including students in Taiwan, may have a harder time grasping this um, paradigm of writing as self-expression. Uh, and indeed, in my own experience, I've also had to sometimes convince my students to um, write about their own experiences rather than a set topic or like finding information online, that kind of thing. Um, so the alternative pedagogical model used in uh, this research is rhetorical composition. Uh, and it has a long tradition starting all the way back in Aristotle from 2019. <laughs> um, but in modern iterations, it sometimes looks like the so-called communicative approach. Uh, and this is drawn from a report by uh, Atkinson and Ramanathan from 95. They report on a program in the US uh, at a university uh, that had two prongs. Like one section was teaching writing to L1 English speakers. The other section was teaching it to L2. L1 used process writing, but L2 uh, did something else. Uh, and uh, we have here a quote from an instructor in that part of the program as interviewed by the two researchers. And the instructor says, quote, I was taught to have students write something, and then at that point, once there's some kind of a product, to work through fairly non-direct means. Non-direct in the sense that we don't say, here's the form, and now fit what you've written into the form, but more like through written feedback or conferencing to try to get the students to mold it into a shape that was acceptable. And that shape was certainly for me the deductively organized essay, end quote. Uh, so from the quotation, we can see that the method of instruction was not specifically product uh, uh, exclusive. Uh, they did care about the process and how the learner um, went through the writing process. But at the end of the day, according to this instructor, most of the time, the product that best fit what the learner wanted to do was a traditional expository essay. Uh, and the emphasis in the L2 program was therefore on communication, not self-expression per se. Um, and in fact, communication, another name for communication is rhetoric. How do you effectively express your ideas? How do you get the audience or reader to understand and respond, uh, engage and respond to those ideas? And that's where Aristotle comes in. Uh, from his classic work, the rhetoric, um, scholars have uh, discerned three uh, key dimensions to a successful text of rhetoric. Uh, and I've summarized them here. Logos, pathos, and ethos. Logos would be uh, sim simplistically the ideas of the text. So things like substantive points, supporting analysis, presentation order, these kinds of things. Pathos would be more about the emotional resonance and uh, the effectiveness of the examples. Um, so by effectiveness, I don't mean how reasonable are they, because that would be supporting analysis. I mean, how well do the examples uh, add to the persuasion of the piece uh, simply by the fact that perhaps it's using a story, perhaps it's putting it into different context, but not by the logic of the example. And then ethos, uh, can be considered as, uh, is there a coherent authorial persona for the re reader to engage with? Does the reader trust that persona? Uh, and uh, for my purposes, um, any writing errors, mechanical errors, I believe would detract from that uh, persona and that trustworthiness. So um, I consider errors as also part of ethos. Um, so that's the framework for the compositions of the, the course under study here. Um, what about the way that they are rated? Well, in the literature, everyone agrees that human raters are very unreliable. Um, Inter-rater and intra-rater reliability 
are generally low. So not just between different people, but also the same person over time is also not very consistent. Um, but the research has also, also shown that these uh, effects can be mitigated to an extent uh, with training based on a common rubric, based on benchmark essays that everyone agrees uh, are um, pegged to a specific score on the rubric. Uh, and if you have multiple raters, they tend to average out uh, as well. Um, so uh, keeping that in mind, these are also the directions that uh, we were heading toward in this study as well. As for automated rating, ChatGPT is not the first software to do this, to be able to do this. In fact, the first recorded automated rating of L1 English compositions uh, happened around 6566. Uh, so in the early days of the computer. Um, and that particular experiment went like this. Uh, the, the researcher gathered four English teachers, uh, had them rate a set of compositions. The overall score was simply adding up all the scores to create the final score for each composition. And then the four teachers discussed possible variables that uh, might be amenable to computer analysis. And they came up with 31 uh, variables. And the researcher then inputted those variables into the computer, ran a batch of compositions through them. Uh, and when comparing the four teachers' grades with the computer's grades, um, the correlations were all somewhere around 0.5 which given the fact that the teachers were not pre-trained, they did not try to, uh, to uh, coordinate their standards uh, and that the computer was programmed post hoc is actually a pretty good correlation. Uh, and for us, it means that any correlation under 0.5 is disastrous because like this is the baseline, right? The first time this happened, they got 0.5. Um, closer to today, uh, there have been a, a few studies already using GPT to rate uh, English compositions. Naismith in 2023 uh, demonstrated that GPT-4 could be effective uh, in assessing essays according to the CFR rubric of coherence. So the CFR rubric has four parts, organization, coherence, vocabulary, and grammar. Um, coherence is more rhetorical. If you look at the specific rubric, it's basically like the essay uh, does this, is effective at doing this uh, or not. And there are several levels. Uh, so this is closer to, to the rubric that we're using in this study. Uh, and according to Naismith, the accuracy achieved was comparable to human raters and uh, is in fact superior to previous automated rating models and was enhanced even further when they used tailored prompts. Uh, although I think you should always be using tailored prompts when when uh, using GPT. Uh, and Yancy et al. also in 23 found that uh, again, according to the CFR rubric, GPT 3.5 and GPT 4 rating of L2 English learner essays, um, th they examined these and they found that GPT 4 nearly matched uh, prior automated writing evaluation systems with when they gave it one calibration example. Uh, interestingly, after giving it more examples, it did not change. So the main difference is between no examples and one example. Um, but of course, previous AWE systems are not ideal. So hopefully we can achieve something slightly better. Uh, and according to Yancy et al, they found that uh, the GPT-4 ratings varied in agreement with human ratings depending on certain test taker L1s. So like for certain language groups, it did better. For certain language groups, it did worse in terms of agreement with human raters. Uh, but they did not try to answer the question of whether that is the fault of GPT or the fault of the humans. So uh, in our study, uh, based on a course where students uh, wrote essays in three, di uh, four different types, but only two genres. We had narrative essays and then three kinds of exposition essays. Students each had to submit two drafts. Then there were also three 
uh, impromptu handwritten compositions according to a final exam and also an open uh, two open ended activities one which produced an essay one to, one which revised the first essay um, the students were notified that they should be using gbt to correct their grammar and spelling uh, some of them use gbt also to draft um, and uh, midway through the semester, they were notified that their output might be the subject of research. This is the schedule that we used uh, teaching the course. Why is the bottom cut out? Sorry about that. Uh, this is the human version of the rubric that we used. Uh, so you see the three dimensions and then there are five levels. The first level is basically as long as you submit something, you get one point. Uh, but for GBT, we had to change this to an additive version so that uh, the input would take. So you see here, it's the same ideas, um, but it's additive. So if it if the essay does something, GBT will give it another point, uh, and so on. In terms of sampling, uh, uh, there were 21 students who signed the consent form including 17 sophomores, two juniors, one super senior from year five, and one super, super senior from year six. Uh, so there should have been 231 compositions, but due to absences, et cetera, we had 207 in total, including one composition, which was used as a benchmark essay. Uh, some of them were handwritten, especially impromptu compositions. So I retyped those. That might be a source of uh, error. I tried not to, um, but you know, handwritten stuff can be chaotic. Uh, and then the essays were anonymized before rating by both humans and the computer. Um, and even though I taught the students, I, I, I at first knew who wrote which, but actually after anonymization, I tended to forget. So that's a good thing. Uh, the human rating procedure, uh, we went in pairs. Um, so one pair of raters uh, did a general exhibition second draft, all three dimensions. And then the second pair rated general exhibition final exam and comparison contrast uh, on the logos dimension. Uh, and I, as the course instructor, I was a member of both pairs. For the GPT, um, we did what I outlined earlier. Uh, we designed a customized GPT, uh, put in the rubric in the instruction box and three benchmark essays known as low, middle, and high benchmark. Uh, and then for each essay, we started a new dialogue, uploaded the PDF with no additional prompting, uh, and we ran the entire batch twice. These are the specific instructions that we, we asked GBT to follow. Uh, in the interest of time, um, I'm going to skip this. OK, then we have the analysis. These are the three different statistics you're going to see. First is the frequency of scale use. Uh, then you have descriptive statistics. And finally, I'll talk about correlations. And we're going to go by dimension and then combined. Uh, so these are the this is the frequency of score use. Troublingly, GBT did not use the highest and lowest scores. Uh, I'll talk more about this in the limitations, but this is something that does affect the subsequent analysis. So the descriptive statistics for uh, logos. Uh, H is human. HC is uh, the human raters in pairs also negotiated to harmonize their scores, come up with a single consensus score, and those are presented as HC, two pairs, so two HCs. And then GPT ran twice. And you'll see here that the GPT mean is noticeably lower and the GPT standard deviation is also mostly lower, although uh, the second human rater had a equivalent standard deviation. For pathos, uh, similar situation. And for ethos, it's even more noticeable. The standard deviation is incredibly low for GPT. And then combined, um, the mean is still lower, but the standard deviation is slightly more comparable. Uh, and I'll talk also, uh, about this in the, well, I guess I'll talk about it now. And it's possibly because we ran dimensions separately so that sometimes uh, GBT would agree with the dimension, but disagree with another dimension. So the overall score standard deviation 
uh, could be plausibly more comparable to human ratings. Correlations, I have put in red the correlations that are not statistically significant. Um, so this is what it looks like for logos. It, I think this is still OK uh, because some humans did correlate with some GBT, or I should put that the other way around. Um, but the, the troubling aspect is the first human raider did not correlate with any GPTs, and this is troubling because the first human raider is the instructor, moi. Ethos gets slightly worse. And then ethos is pretty bad, I, I have to admit. And there, there might be several reasons for this uh, because we, we calibrated the rubric according to logos. Um, so we didn't uh, pre-run ethos for further calibration. That might be something we'll do in the future. That will be something we'll do in the future. Uh, and then these are the combined correlations. Uh, again, not very good. The consensus scores did not correlate with GBT. The instructor scores did not correlate with GBT. Uh, so some possible reasons for this. First, we had non-random sampling. The students all came from one class section and they had to volunteer. Um, we might expand this to further class sections uh, include different students, but I think we're going to keep the voluntary part. It would be more ethical, especially because uh, there are no set topics for these compositions, so the content might be somewhat personal. Uh, and currently, we've only analyzed essays from one genre. Uh, perhaps there might be improvement if we include narrative and argument essays. Uh, there might be human inter-rater inconsistency because none of us are uh, trained writing pedagogists. Uh, and there might also be some centrality bias from ChatGPT, although this could also possibly be because of the benchmark uh, level. It's possible that the benchmarks, the high and low benchmarks were too good and too bad respectively. Um, we can test that by adjusting the benchmarks in the future. Although it is worth noting that before inputting benchmarks, GPT already had a centrality bias. But um, the Results might also be influenced by some conceptual limitations. GBT was created by machine learning, but not machine learning for writing assessment. Um, so is it, it could be possible that in order to get a truly reliable and consistent rater, it would require further machine learning and training. But doing this would go against our set goals of uh, ecological validity and wide accessibility. It wouldn't work if every instructor had to machine train their own GPT. Um, so hopefully we can find a way that doesn't require further machine learning. Um, but a bigger question might be, could this even be possible? We know that GPT is a simulacrum of human use of language in the aggregate, but the type of composition used in the course is rhetorical and so necessarily uh, subject to rater um, ideas of what is a good rhetorical composition. So could it be possible that a rhetorical rubric uh, is impossible to uh, let GBT produce reliable and consistent ratings of? Um, the only way to tell about this is if we uh, exhaust all other possibilities and it still doesn't work. What are we going to do next? We're going to include the other two genres. We already have narrative compositions. Argument compositions will come from the second semester course, which is happening this semester. Uh, and the student uh, participants in this course is slightly different from last semester. So we might get a bit more variety. And finally, we perhaps might benefit from inviting subject experts in writing pedagogy uh, to help um, provide conceptual guidance and also perhaps more reliable rating. And these are the references cited in the presentation. There are more if you want. Uh, and now let's open up the floor for questions. Yeah. I have lost this. Anybody else has to ask a question? You have one minute before they open the show. Oh, this, this, this conference will not right? I think I just think it's an open question. But, uh, oh, yeah. 
Uh, Remember, Scott, you're being recorded. Please, I can't swear or call people names. Um, <coughs> okay, I'm not even sure where to begin, but, but this is great. I, I really like this. And, and uh, you know, I, I talked with Jason and Joe a lot about uh, what ChatGPT is doing with when, when, it's, when it's assigning ratings. Um, I mean, one of the things I've said to Jason and Joe in, in private is that, that, um, geez. No. is that, that this is sort of like, like the end, the end goal of, of this world of chat GPT score assignment. And, um, but, but that, and there, there's a whole bunch of other stuff that comes before this. And when I'm watching this, one of the things that that's clear to me is that we don't know what ChatGPT is doing when, when it's assigning these scores. Um, like there's some kind of process going on. Now, when I talk with, with you, et cetera, I call this cognition because I think this is, this is, a, this is a kind of cognition. Uh, it's machine cognition. And, and what you're showing is that it's not necessarily the same thing that's going on in your head when you're assigning scores, but it is a form of, co I, I call it cognition, but it's a form of sort of assigning scores. Um, and the pro, but it, it's different than you when you're assigning scores, but it is a reliable form of assigning scores. In fact, it's probably more reliable than humans. But, but what it's doing when it's, it's calculating that score is not clear. And we need a whole bunch of preliminary studies to, to figure out that mechanism. Yeah, thank you. That is true. Uh, when um, using GBT, we did ask it to spit out written feedback, but usually the written feedback took the form of uh, this essay is about this. It managed to do this, but it did not manage to do that. Therefore, I give it this score. So it's basically copy pasting our rubric. Uh, so we don't really know how it's reaching its own judgments. Um, and as you said, like this could be a problem because you know, it has its own way of doing things. We have our own way of judging things. And if we don't know what it's thinking, then it's harder to get the two to match. It is like in the paradigm of this study is to try to get GPT to match humans, but it is possible that the solution could be to get humans to match GPT. Not at the moment though, because GPT isn't using the highest and lowest scores. But as you said, it could be more reliable as we saw in the standard deviations being smaller than human ratings. Well, well the, your, your measurements were really interesting for me because it, it's sort of like, um, I don't know, I don't have a good way to, to talk about this here, um, but I want to look at that more closely. Okay, go well. Yeah, so this this is being recorded. I'm going to upload this to YouTube later. So uh, if you want to take a closer look, I'll send you the link. Yeah, I don't have any followers. Not yet. I'll, I'll make sure you get some. Okay. Um, yeah, because I wasn't aware of all the measurements you guys were going to do with this. So this is very interesting. I'm going to look at this more closely. Yeah, all you. right. Thank you, Scott. Uh, Jojo, do you have questions? No, I mean, like, uh, Scott is just wondering, like, um, how the chat chat you know, grades the score, right? I think maybe one way is instead of, like, throwing the entire composition into the program, you do it sentence by sentence, by sentence so you analyze each sentence, or you can do it paragraph by paragraph. Maybe you can have Right. So uh, for those at home who didn't hear, Jojo was saying perhaps if we go at a lower level, sentence by sentence or paragraph by paragraph, we might be able to figure out what GPT is doing and uh, help guide it to be more like what we want it to do. Uh, we did consider this. And in fact, when looking through the literature, we saw that most studies focused on linguistic phenomena, which is closer to what you're talking about. Um, but the thing is, the, the way the rubric is designed, uh, it's focused on the overall effect of the composition. So like if we go by sentence, then what sentence would be able to, we would be able to say evokes common human experiences. If we go by paragraph, how do we know if the entire essay has a good presentation order? Um, so this is what I was talking about in the limitations. This could be a conceptual limitation of the study. Right. 
Right, right. If we only focus on linguistic phenomena, a lot of people have done that, and it does work quite well. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Joe actually showed me that spreadsheet. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah, so Scott is saying that uh, he and Joe ran some paragraphs uh, through GPT using the CEFR rubric. Uh, out of 10 times, it flipped scores once or twice, I remember. But, but the score stabilizes very quick after about, after about four of the tools. Yeah. So you get about like three or four sentences, and then you can go a thousand sentences, and the score won't change. Right. So, now, this is a much more complicated rubric. I was going to say, because the CEFR rubric is more standardized, so it should be an even lower probability for GPT to flip the score. Yeah, it's worth exploring in the future. That's true. Yeah, and so we're out of time. If you have further questions, uh, I'm open to answering and discussing after uh, during the break. Thank you for coming.